Talk Genealogy, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode nine of the Talk Genealogy podcast, the podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. This evening, we're going to talk about the great roles or pipe roles of medieval government in England and how they can help the family history enthusiast. For the avoidance of doubt, we did used to call this podcast Family Trees Talk, but you thought I might like to change it, so here it is under its new banner. The podcast and the website have the same name. Now, there's a novelty. You know, I can bore for England when it comes to the pipe rolls. I think everything about them is just inspiring. And I know I do tend to go on a bit when I've got them in my head. So I've had to narrow this evening's talk down to just four objectives. Believe me, this has been painful and I've still exceeded the word count. Firstly, I want to share with you, briefly, I promise, the history of the rolls and try and get across some of their magic. Then I want to talk about how scholars have worked on them and made them accessible. Here we'll be talking about the Pipe Roll Society. Thirdly, I'd like to point out some of the difficulties when it comes to working with them. Well, not so much difficulties, just a few pitfalls that we need to avoid. And then I'll go through how the Pipe Rolls can help us in our family history projects. I need to remind you that I'm neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an enthusiast, like you, who has spent more than 50 years digging up his family tree. And these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learned on the way. The Pike Rolls are a series of tax audits maintained by the Exchequer from about the 12th to the 19th centuries. Some people say that they originated in Norman or even Saxon times, And it seems natural that some sort of financial record would have been kept. But the Pike Rolls present us with a long view of our national fiscal history from the late years of Henry I onwards. And in that respect, they do have a unique place in our national heritage. Now, I want to take just a couple of seconds out to go over the difference between Pike Rolls, Close Rolls and Patent Rolls. It is easy to get bamboozled when people start throwing these terms around. Here, I'm drawing on comments from David Iredale's classic, Working With Archives. He was very good at taking the stuffing out of things and showing how straightforward they were. Rolls patent are made up of documents delivered openly, granting licences and privileges, while closed rolls were delivered closed and gave decisions on provisioning of castles or estates, payment of officials, restitution of lands and pardons. Close rolls are often useful for ancillary information written on the back of the documents. So you can see the purpose and nature of close rolls and rolls patent were very different from the pipe rolls. All right, here we go. I think Henry I gets a raw deal. Yes, he acquired the throne in dubious circumstances following the death of William Rufus in the New Forest, and he was an adulterous scallywag and far too ambitious for his brother's good. And in spite of all his promises, he levied extortionate taxes. But from the start, he decided that if he was going to do this king thing, he was going to do it properly. And that meant getting the money right, and that meant surrounding himself with a civil service which he, and to a lesser extent the barons, could trust. Now, Henry was always closer to a tyrant than a democrat. But when we look at his civil service, his exchequer, we can see the beginnings of modern government. Okay, very rudimentary, but it was there. Now, I don't want to overegg the pudding. I've called the pipe rolls records of a tax audit, and we have to keep that in mind. It would be wrong to think of them as the government budget or a complete record of public income. 
They were tax positions from the county sheriffs. And it was Henry's effort to establish the integrity and accuracy of these roles which mark them now as important historical documents. Some people say that at the time they helped him get away with heavy taxation, as we'll see later in this talk. Each year, two periods were scheduled for the general taxation of the sheriffs from the counties. Easter and Michaelmas, though it was the Michaelmas session that brought in most of the money. OK, it's time to paint a picture. The exchequer is set up. In the middle of the hall is a large table covered with dark cloth, with white strips drawn across its width. These form nine columns. A four-inch plinth is attached to each edge. Around the table are upwards of a dozen officials in their 12th century garb, but being ye old England, it is cold indoors. The folk have a sort of <laughs> whiff about them, and when they open their mouths, the modern ear wouldn't be able to understand a word they were saying. The sheriff and his supporter are called in. Are you ready to account for the tax? Yes, he says, and then the argy-bargy begins. One of the officials refers to last year's role as a starter, a model for payment. The sheriff produces any tokens of prior payment. He may have been forced to pay someone account at Easter. Some things don't change, do they? These tokens may be written scripts, or they may have been notches on official wooden tokens, some of which have survived. He may also seek to claim other offsets. Now, this is the clever part. The table is divided into columns for pence, shillings, pounds, scores of pounds, hundreds of pounds, thousands and tens of thousands, with an empty column at each end. The official places on one side the taxes which are due. Tuppence for this, two score for that, a bob here, and so on and the accepted receipts or allowances in the columns at the other side of the table. Because they are set out in recognised patterns, you can tell any difference without counting or totalling them. Think of the patterns on dominoes. You can see that one side is three dots short. Furthermore, there will be no need to total the columns before settling up. You can see that for every column to balance, I need to add three shillings to the shilling columns, you owe me two score, and I need to make up three pence in the pence column. I'll put a picture on the show notes for tonight's episode to illustrate the point. Now, the figures were carefully totaled and recorded, at least from the end of the 12th century, not so much before. But the fact remains that the sheriff and everyone saw the calculation and was expecting the answer before it was officially recorded. He knew what was coming and where it was coming from. In this way, the imposition of tax may have been unfair, but its collection was seen to be honest. Some people believe that this is part of the reason the sheriffs put up with heavy levies imposed on them, especially by Henry's two and three. Now, once the transaction was recorded on the Great Roll, it was forever legally fact, whether it was in error or not. It was a reference point, rather like the Doomsday Book had been. So the Crown needed to be sure of it, and took great pains to impose integrity. No erasures were allowed. Any error was shown by underlining with an accurate line written afresh. This was done before the taxpayer left the room. More than one contemporary copy was made, and in each case at least one person was looking over the scribe's shoulder to make sure it was correct. And because they were now legal facts of the king's relationship with his people, the roles were wrapped 
and carefully stored for posterity. Folks, this is England's history in detail, written on rolls of sheepskin 15 inches wide, a pair of membranes to each leaf, and then the lot gathered together into a roll. But unlike Doomsday, which provided a once and for all snapshot of the country, the pipe rolls were ongoing. By the way, they were probably called pipe rolls because of their shape when rolled up. We don't know for sure, but hey, don't pay too much attention to the more imaginative explanations. Now let's have 20 seconds of music before we talk about how we can use the pipe rolls. Can I remind you that the show notes for this and previous episodes can be found on the website talkgenealogy.wordpress.com This month I've included some links which I hope you'll find interesting if you want to hear more about the roles. By the way, I have reshaped the website to help us get the most out of it. It now includes a bibliography and a written blog for when I want to post something worthwhile that I've found. Let me know what you think. Regular followers of the podcast will know that I like to include profiles of the early genealogists. And although we haven't time to give them proper space this evening, we do need to acknowledge the contributions of some dusty Victorian archivists without whom. It's impossible to clip Thomas Duffus Hardy's life and career into a brief paragraph. But how would you like to serve your apprenticeship in the Records Office of the Tower of London, before being appointed, under Palgrave mind, to the newly established Public Records Office. It sounds great, doesn't it? (laughs) Hardy prepared many series of medieval documents for publication and published his Introduction to the Close Rolls. This very much paved the way for the publication of the Pipe Rolls, which followed many of his conventions. I will offer a comprehensive profile of Hardy in a later podcast. But things really got going in 1883 with the formation of the Pipe Roll Society. And for this we must thank Walford Dakin Selby and his colleague James Greenstreet. Selby had joined the Public Records Office in 1867, he was 22, and he was eventually appointed the search superintendent. From 1884, the year after the formation of the Society and the publication of its first titles, he edited The Genealogist. But Selby was in some ways a tragic figure. He took his own life in his mid-forties. So now we can see that from the start of Victoria's reign, there was a clutch of antiquarians who were determined to make the roles more accessible. For me... Their approach is best evidenced through the Pipe Roll Society's publication in 1884 of the excellent introduction to the study of pipe rolls. It had quite a restricted print run, only 350 copies in its first edition, but don't worry, digital copies are freely available, that is, available for nothing. And you can use a link which I'll copy onto the show notes. After a detailed introduction and account of the pipe roll procedures, this book gives not only a list of abbreviations that we are likely to meet, but also some useful guidance on how to interpret those abbreviations. Then we are given a glossary of terms, again with practical explanations, although I have to say you may not find the glossary as complete as you'd like. And so, for anyone who is a little wary of dipping their toe into the waters of the pipe rolls, I think this book is a treasure. I've gone back to it as one of the main sources for this talk, and it's put me right on many of my misconceptions. Now, all of this means that we don't have to work through the court hand of medieval secretaries. Sufficient series have been transcribed and published, so that we can hope to catch a volume for the generations that we might be looking for. I wonder if I can just offer a couple of points of advice before you jump in. 
First and foremost, for goodness sake, record which volumes you've checked. Not just the years and the pages, but also add your own comment, which will help you recognise which transcript it was. Believe me, you will want to revisit these books, and good note-taking will save you hours. This sounds rather basic, doesn't it? But I'm afraid I have too often wandered from this particular path to my own real irritation. Next, take a broad view when it comes to names. A patient view. A student's view, perhaps. In his introduction to the close roles, which I've mentioned above, Hardy gave some advice, warnings really, about the treatment of proper names, people and places, by the medieval scribes. Now, I guess we are all used to Latinization of names in Paris registers, when John becomes Johannes and James Jacobus. But with the roles, we are confronted with a preference for Gallicizing names. Remember, Norman French was the official legal language of the time. I like the example that Hardy cites for Franco and Latin versions of Whitchurch. The attentive genealogist might pick up Blancmuster or even Blancmustier. But I must admit, I would pass over to Elbow Monasterio before catching it as Whitchurch, the market town in Shropshire. The scripture of my own surname, Noble, in the rolls sometimes appears so imaginative that I have taken to submitting the different versions for family arbitration before taking them further. You may remember in the first of these podcasts, I mentioned that it becomes easier to interpret a Tudor will if we can appreciate the approach of the scribe, and to some extent the same thing is true here. The record was formal and studious, but it is possible to recognise the idiosyncrasies when they do occur. And oh, by the way, many of the published transcripts have separate indexes for names and things, Make sure you're looking at the right one. Now my third piece of advice is, is really probably the most important. Fully interpret each entry. I suppose the proper word is translation. Small differences can make quite a difference in meaning. The introductory volume I've mentioned is a big help in this, especially where it explains the squiggly marks above and through the letters which indicate the extent of abbreviation. Yes, you will get used to the language quickly enough, but I still like to copy an entry in longhand, double-spaced, and then I annotate it in pencil with the meaning of each word. Believe me, every letter, every squiggle, and most, though not all, differences do mean something. Also, get used to using the years of the realm instead of the modern dating. You will soon pick it up, and with practice it will become as natural as using the regular calendar. Remember, the years start from the anniversary of the monarch's accession. And next, establish the context by reading the role very broadly. What was your subject's position compared with other people in the county? Was the county going through a good or a bad time? Who were the big players? Is it possible to relate national events, storms and pestilence to the evidence of the pipe rolls? I'm saying make the pipe roll useful to you. Even if you don't find the name you're looking for, especially if you know the family was in the county at the time. You would be unlucky if gathering this knowledge and background didn't pay dividends in the long run. Look upon it as a good meal. You don't want to hurry it. It has been transcribed and made available to you. I suppose explore it, that's what I'm saying. The pipe rolls are an example of research where the genealogist is likely to pick up scraps of information, indicators, rather than a body of information which, for example, the later half-tax returns might offer. 
So you need a cataloging system that allows you to record, store and retrieve this type of stray information. The alternative is hours of wasted work. And I think most of us have learned the hard way. Now, how can the pipe rolls be useful to us? Many books for the family historian give scant attention to pipe rolls. Perhaps they seem too remote. And yes, they are likely to be of greater value to the local or fiscal historian rather than the genealogist. Some authors begin by emphasising how few of us are likely to find an ancestor included in the role. An assessment I very much disagree with, by the way. And boy, I get fed up with people preaching this line. But here is not the place to call the mathematics into the matter. Should you resist the temptation to complete a survey of surnames of interest in the roles? Well, since this is the podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands, I might say go ahead. You will come up with a patchwork of instances which will be of interest and might concentrate further research in a particular part of the country. But be aware you will be embarking on a lot of work for little genealogical progress. Because the roles are so mean when it comes to defining relationships. Perhaps this is the work more relevant for a one-name group, uh, but then again, perhaps I should own up. Of course, I'm interested in the early occurrences of my surname, so, a bit at a time, I am completing a sort of lazy man's survey. And I cannot resist being rather smug when I find an earlier occurrence than the earliest mentioned by the experts. The roles are more useful when you have particular lines of research that you want to flesh out, if you like, when you have a question that they may be able to progress. The roles are unlikely to give us much information about descents, other than sometimes mentioning a father or a son. But of course, an entry is prima facie evidence that the character was alive and kicking, so we can mark FL and a date on the record card in our index or column on our spreadsheet. This is important when we want to analyse generations of landholders, for example, or showing that a marriage might relate to a widow of our subject or someone else's wife entirely. And of course they do give a snippet of information about the ancestor's life. You can see here how the pipe roll should be part of our armoury when we come to verify a hypothesis. Remember that key from a previous podcast? Research, analysis, hypothesis and proof. I think it's important to train ourselves to use them before we need to use them. And if we've taken our opportunity to get familiar with them, coming back to that concept of an enjoyable meal again, I suppose then they become a quick and handy reference. That's why I want to encourage you to work with the pipe rolls as practice at interpreting transcripts of old documents. The Latin terms, the legal and secretarial terms, are always useful to know. And once you have interpreted some entries in the detailed way that I mentioned above, you'll be surprised how quickly no document becomes too daunting. The discipline of going through a document or transcript letter by letter, inflection by inflection, soon becomes a habit, and you'll be surprised how soon you'll catch yourself thinking, hey, I can have a go at that. Thank you for listening to episode 9 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. Please get in touch if you have any thoughts or comments or a family history story that you'd like to tell. Can I remind you that the show notes for tonight's episode can be found on talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. The next episode will be posted at 7.30pm UK time on the 3rd of May. May I point out that the Pipe Roll Society continues today. 
a link is on the show notes again. You know, I always counsel, spend no money on genealogy, and beware, there's a lot of wolves out there. But sometimes it's nice to say thank you. It's very cheap to join the Pipe Roll Society, and it's one of those simple ways of putting something back into our hobby. And they do have a nice stick pin and tie. My thanks to Freeze Effects for the music, Emily Brooks for the voiceover, but most of all, thank you for listening. Good night, and God bless. <laughs>